Okay. Well, good evening, and thank you for attending the third in our lecture series on the psychology of creativity and expertise, robots, quiz, action. Uh, I'm joined by our two previous speakers, Dr. Gillian Hill and Dr. Catherine Friedlander, uh, and they will be asking me your questions at the end. So please do put any questions you have into the Q&A box as we go along, and I look forward to addressing them later. And today I'll be moving from creativity, which was the topic of the previous two lectures, into expertise and asking how successful quizzes know so much. Now, much of this talk is based on research carried out by Emma Foster as part of her MSc in psychology a couple of years ago here at Buckingham, supervised by myself and Catherine. And I'm delighted to be able to share some of her research with you tonight. I think she may actually be on the webinar. But first, some quiz questions. Who won the Oscar for Best Actress in 2000? On the border of which two countries would you find the Victoria Falls? And what links Tuscany, one of a quartet of superhero shelled reptiles, and the ceiling of a certain chapel in the Vatican? Do you know? Well, we'll come back to the answers at the end. So, Quiz has been a popular pastime for many years and it comes in many forms. For instance, one staple of quiz is general knowledge and trivia seen in books and games such as Trivial Pursuit, as well as at pub quizzes and on websites such as Sporkle.com. Um, this example, in fact, is a timed quiz where you've got 10 minutes to type the names of all the US presidents. And you can see it's not up to date, uh, stopping as it does with Obama. Of course, there's a whole host of broadcast quizzes as well on both radio and television. Uh, there's Jay Flynn's weekly quiz on BBC Radio 2 Breakfast with Zoe Ball, for instance. There's Brain of Britain, which has been running on Radio 4 since 1953, I think without a stop. Examples of well-known TV quizzes include things like The Chase, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Only Connect, and very recently, Puzzling with Lucy Worsley on Channel 5, which I think has been going about six weeks now. Some of you might even remember Bob Holness's Blockbusters with its infamous Can I Have a Pee Please Bob, which led to one of many quiz board games that you'll see in the shots. Now, we can rank quizzes and in fact people in any domain in terms of a range of levels of performance. And Hoffman, put forward six levels of proficiency from novice, people who are just starting out in the field, by a competent journeyman to highly regarded experts who perform at a consistently high level right up to the masters, the elite super experts. And it's these elite super expert quizzes at the master level that we're going to be particularly interested in today. One such super expert is Kevin Ashman, he won Mastermind in 1995, scoring 41 points with no passes. This is the highest ever score. He won Brain of Britain on Radio 4, again, with the highest ever score. And he's been a professional egghead since 2003. It's safe to say that he is or has been considered the world number one in terms of official rankings. Uh, Olaf Bortom, who is an alumnus of Nottingham Trent University, has won the World Quizzing Championships twice in 2003 and 2015. And he's been an egghead since 2021. And both Kevin and Olaf work as professional question setters as well. I mentioned the eggheads. Well, the eggheads and the chasers, they're all likely to be at Hoffman's master level as well. And many of them have won individual quiz shows themselves in the past. So I've told you something about quiz and introduced some elite quizzes, but perhaps I should say something about what we mean by expertise. Well, experts are those individuals who can demonstrate levels of performance or skill sets or knowledge which are reproducibly superior to other people who are active in that domain. And these superior levels might include being a chess grandmaster, uh, being the winner of the Cardiff Singer of the Year, an eminent professor, an Olympic sprinter, or an elite quizzer. And I say reproducibly 
because their superior performance has to be consistent and reliable. It's not just a flash in the pan. And this leads us to ask certain key questions about expertise in general and quiz expertise in particular. We know who the masters are, you met them on the previous slide, but who are the experts? What are they like? And what about those at journeyman level? How do they differ between each level and how can we benchmark them? In other words, what are the characteristics of someone at each of those particular levels? Perhaps a journeyman is someone who sticks with pub quizzes and doesn't progress onto the quiz leagues, but an expert does. Possible? We'd like to find out. A second important question is how experts achieve their expertise. How do expert quizzes become expert quizzes? How do they know so much? Is it because they carry out lots of what Anders Ericsson calls deliberate practice? This is the inherently unenjoyable, tedious, structured private rehearsal of domain specific skills, which lead to an improvement. Think of a violinist practicing scales, for instance. And for quizzes, it's probably learning lists of facts. Or is it due to soaking up knowledge like a sponge, a kind of informational osmosis that just happens? Or is it due to some other cognitive skill sets, which I'll mention later? But that's a second question. And the third question, why aren't we all elite super experts? Why don't some quizzers, even if they participate in quiz after quiz after quiz, make it beyond journeyman level? And these are the sorts of questions we are interested in answering. So there are various possible explanations for how quizzes know so much. Do we know which ones? Do we know which ones to test? Well, not yet. We can't just assume that we know what all the various cognitive skills involved are, because something key might not have occurred to us. And this issue of researchers being rather blinkered as to what they believe the key factors are is a potential problem in expertise research. If they think they know what they're trying to find, there is a danger that they will concentrate on that and ignore other potentially important characteristics of the experts, a sort of confirmation bias. For instance, we could just assume that all quizzes have a better than average working memory and test that but we've missed many other possible explanations. We don't yet know what we should be testing. And for this reason, Catherine and I developed the Grounded Expertise Components Approach, or GICA for short, which we published about in 2016. And the first stage of this approach is to carry out a broad-based survey of people of all levels of proficiency who are active in the field across a wide range of dimensions. And this can be used to inform subsequent research into the drivers of expertise in this domain in a grounded way. In other words, we can find out what makes experts become experts, and what makes quizzes know so much by knowing what to ask them. However, there's not been very much research on quiz or quiz expertise, and none of the three of us, uh, Emma, Catherine and myself, are elite quizzers, so it wasn't necessarily clear to us what such a survey should cover and we didn't want to miss anything important by mistake. So the best thing we decided to do was to ask the quizzes themselves. And in effect, what we were doing was a pre-GICA stage to help us develop a comprehensive survey for GICA stage one, knowing what to include. Now, there are many challenges, particularly of a cognitive nature, involved in quiz uh, and particularly successful quizzing and we wanted to tap into some of these. Now many quizzes involve general knowledge and Elizabeth Mailer who's now at Warwick University suggested that to excel in general knowledge quizzes, quizzes re require a number of key skills. The first is perhaps obviously to know a lot uh, to have a, a, a good semantic knowledge. But actually a large knowledge base by itself isn't enough. It needs to be efficiently organized so that remembering one fact can prompt recall of another and another and, and so on. Successful quizzes also need to be able to learn the information in the first place so that they need to show efficient encoding of material. 
and be able to recall it when needed. Moreover, they need to be able to decide swiftly whether the answer they brought to mind is correct or not. And to resolve tip of the tongue moments quickly, not being stuck knowing, for instance, that the capital of Ghana starts with an A and has two syllables, but not being able to come up with the answer. I wonder how many of you are in that position right now. There are other potential cognitive and motor challenges involved in quiz as well. Successful quizzes often need to come up with the answer quickly and beat others to the button press, particularly if it's an easy question. For instance, in the fastest finger first round for identifying the next contestant to sit in the who wants to be a millionaire chair. Some quizzes also involve quizzes making connections between apparently unrelated items, such as the third quiz question that I asked at the start of today's talk. I'll give you the answer for that later. Only Connect, Puzzling and Brain of Britain are all broadcast quizzes which require this making connections skill. Oh, in case you're still wondering, the capital of Ghana is Accra. It begins with A and it has two syllables. Now, before I talk about the cognitive skills involved in quizzing, it's worth saying a little bit more about how our long-term memory works and why elite quizzes are so extraordinary. Along with episodic memory, which is our memory for events, what we did yesterday, for instance, semantic memory relates to facts and knowledge, what we know, who, what, where, when. Now, semantic and episodic memory together are called declarative memory, things that I can declare, that I can tell you, as opposed to procedural memories for skills such as juggling or touch typing or doing up your shoelaces. Now, we can think of the complexity of semantic memories on a continuum between uh, embellished and lean. Um, embellished memories tend to involve rich inf information, often interconnected to other pieces of knowledge. For instance, the 50,000 chess positions that chess grandmasters will know, London's 25,000 streets, which taxi drivers learn when they're doing the knowledge, or indeed any academic subject in depth. On the other hand, lean semantic traces may involve less deep processing and the information may, may be less connected to other information. And one example is Scrabble and Scrabble alphagrams. Now, alphagrams are alphabetical strings of between three and eight letters together with their real word anagrams. And here I show you some of its sides. So I'll read it out, A-E-I-N-R-S-T, that seven letter uh, um, alphagram. And it's shown with its eight real anagrams. Uh, in fact, only three or four of those anagrams are particularly common words. And Scrabble experts will use these alphagrams to help them learn the official list of 260,000 English words but there's no need for them to learn the word meanings or the associations with other words. They only need to know what words you can make with these letters. So we'd say that this memory is lean rather than embellished. And given the nature of quiz questions and the fact it's often related facts you're trying to find, we might expect quiz related knowledge to be rather more embellished. Another point about memory and knowledge in quiz uh, relates to the breadth of someone's domain specific knowledge. Experts are usually only experts in one domain, having a fairly, fairly circumscribed body of knowledge. Um, Stefan Lewandowski uh, has, says it, it should come as no surprise that expert archaeologists are not necessarily also outstanding oceanographers, and that expert psychologists are unlikely also to be world-class ornithologists. But the domain that most quizzes excel in is that of general knowledge, as I mentioned. And this is an extremely broad area. So if quizzes do deliberately learn facts, how do they know which facts to concentrate on, given that almost anything could come up on the day? Now, as I mentioned before, when I talked about deliberate practice, 
From a psychological point of view, we are particularly interested in the cognitive skills which we might expect to be involved in successful quizzing. And one good framework for thinking about such skills is what is called the cattell horn carroll theory of cognitive abilities, first put forward in the 1990s. And this includes 16 skills related to knowledge, attention, speed of processing, uh, perception and motor abilities, all called G something, as G denotes general intelligence. And we would expect several of these to be specifically relevant for quiz and quiz expertise. Firstly, there's GC, our crystallized knowledge. And this is crystallized intelligence or knowledge. This is our knowledge base, all the things that we know. And clearly without knowing lots of things, you're not going to be good at quiz. Secondly, we need to be able to learn efficiently and then fluently retrieve the answers as needed. This is called GLR. And this might also relate to the resolution of tip of the tongue moments. People who are, have a better GLR may be better able to resolve them. As I've already mentioned, speed is sometimes important too, both for selecting through possible answer options and deciding quickly which one is correct, that's GT, and also the psychomotor ability to be able to press the buzzer quickly, but only when sure of the answer, GS and GPS. And that is particularly important for easy questions against other opponents who might buzz in first. Finally, those quizzes that require us to make these connections between disparate pieces of information suggest the need for a good fluid intelligence, GF. And this involves the deliberate use of thinking to solve novel problems, to reason, to draw inferences from information, what we might call thinking on one's feet. And fluid intelligence itself links to executive functions. Excuse me, links to executive functions, uh, which include working memory to hold multiple pieces of information in the mind uh, and monitor where we've got to in a sequence, for instance. Uh, the ability to inhibit wrong but speciously attractive answers, red herrings, uh, and the ability to switch between different thinking processes or goals. And although these executive functions are probably not that relevant to straightforward general knowledge quizzes, they are likely to be needed in more puzzle type quizzes where lateral thinking or complex manipulation of ideas are involved. There are various motivational drivers which we could hypothesize are important in determining why people start quizzing, whether they stick with it, and whether they end up at the top of their game or not. Such motivational drivers could be both intrinsic, so for instance, the enjoyment of winning, and extrinsic. Good example is the chance to win a million pounds, which in fact six people have managed to do in the British version of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Um, those six do not include Charles Ingram, who was found later to have cheated. And you might have seen the drama documentary about him a few years ago. For some quizzes, competitiveness might be important, particularly for those at the top of their game. They want to remain at the top. There's a psychological concept called need for cognition. Um, and we, we could think of this as having an itchy brain and wanting to scratch it. And this is likely to be involved as well. Quizzes and puzzles are certainly more likely to appeal to those people who like thinking. If you don't like thinking, you're not going to enjoy puzzles and quizzes. There are social aspects too. For instance, being in a regular team in pub quizzes is likely to be a very strong motivator for some people. And quizzing seems to be a lifelong pursuit for many. But one question we can ask is whether the people doing, sorry, when people start doing quizzes seriously. Professional musicians and chess grandmasters often start when children. But mine and Catherine's own research has shown that cryptic crossword super experts, Hoffman's masters, tend not to start much before teenage years and sometimes later. Currently, we don't know very much about when quizzes first take up quizzing, and that's something we were hoping to find out more about through the study I'm telling you about today. 
Now, although we've identified many uh, potential skills and motivational drivers important in quizzing, the main research question that we're addressing today is how successful quizzes develop their prodigious knowledge? How do they know so much? And it rela that relates also to what makes them quiz. Now, how do they know so much? Is it because they're good at absorbing facts, just soaking them up like a sponge? Or is it perhaps due to deliberate practice, which I talked about before, purposefully learning? For instance, the um, 193 countries of the world, which are member states of the UN, together with their flags, or maybe a list of the names of the 88 constellations in the sky, or perhaps the winners of every Best Actress Oscar since the 1920s when it started. This picture incidentally shows Catherine Hepburn's four Oscars, uh, because a piece of trivia for you, she won more uh, Best Actress Oscars than anyone else. If you did know all of your Oscars, you would know the answer to the first question, which I told you at the beginning, uh, which I asked you at the beginning of today's quiz. Now, Anders Ericsson you know, was a strong supporter of deliberate practice, and he showed that it was necessary for fields like chess and musical performance. But deliberate practice, such as this list learning that I just talked about, isn't likely to be either that easy or that enjoyable. And indeed, Catherine and I have found that cryptic crossword experts don't tend to do any deliberate practice at all, or at least very little. Whether quizzes do so or not, we don't know. So the overall aims of this study are to explore the practice regimes of successful quizzes and find out something about the motivational drivers behind their desires to quiz. And ultimately, the interviews that I'm going to tell you about today enabled us to develop a comprehensive GICA stage one survey, as I explained earlier. So to enable us to find out more about what makes successful quizzes tick, how they got into quiz, why they quiz now, and what they think has explained their success, Emma carried out interviews with seven elite quizzes. So all of them are at Hoffman's master level. They were all winners of British TV or radio quiz shows, or possibly both, or professional quiz setters, and some of them were both quiz setters and quiz winners. As you can see, five were male, two were female, uh, and they're all, uh, they will have a good um, list of achievements there. So what we did was we carried out semi-structured interviews meaning that we had planned out a set of questions in, a, in advance to enable us to ask about the things we knew we were interested in, but also it gave us the flexibility to move into other topics if the interviewee talks about something that we hadn't considered. And indeed, this did happen. There were a few things that came up that we hadn't thought of. And ultimately, these interviews supply us with rich, detailed data for subsequent qualitative analysis. And... The method we used is called thematic analysis, which enables us to develop underlying themes from the interviews. Emma, in fact, developed seven themes and sub-themes for her master's thesis. Today, I'm just going to focus on the four themes which are particularly relevant to our research questions today. Why do people quiz and how do experts know so much? Now, it's important for researchers to acknowledge that they are real people with their own views and their own experiences, their baggage, if you like, and that we quite understandably interpret and analyse what interviewees say through the lens of these views and experiences. And being aware of this is called reflexivity. And it's very important that we, uh, that we acknowledge this. So in this case, Six of these seven quizzes were personal acquaintances of myself or Catherine, uh, and one was an acquaintance of Jill, who spoke four weeks ago and is on this call, this webinar. Um, and this meant that we could provide an introduction between them and Emma, sort of breaking the ice to an extent, although Emma did carry out the actual interviews. In terms of our experience, I quiz quite a lot, uh, particularly on Sporkle, and I also write uh, pub quizzes and quizzes for theatre groups. 
Um, and the three of us all watch quiz shows, but none of us are what we would call an elite level. But we clearly have an interest in quiz. So what did we find? Well, the four themes I want to talk to you about today can be seen on this slide. And I'm going to unpack each of them individually over the next few slides. For each theme, I'll give you some actual quotes from our elite quizzes and talk about what we can infer from this, starting with thirst for knowledge. So, this theme spoke to the view that quizzes always wanted to know more, that they found learning enjoyable, particularly when they were interested in the subject matter. One said it's just a pure a sponge thing, it's pure retention, it just goes in like that. Another said, food and drink is one of my strongest subjects because I love cooking in a serious way. If you're interested in something, you find it much more enjoyable and perhaps easier to learn the relevant information, whether by deliberately or just picking it up. Several of the quizzes said that they'd always had a good memory ever since childhood and they tended to enjoy browsing encyclopedias and having uh, hobbies like stamp collecting. Uh, one said, oh, the Dunlop Book of Facts. It was just wonderful. High mountains, longest rivers, all that good stuff. And it was really great. And another, I know the order of the kings and queens of England, because when I was about nine, I sort of thought this would be a good thing to know. So perhaps not every nine-year-old would, would share the same view, but we can see this uh, curiosity there. And the, the fact that this is an interesting thing and something they want to do. And this clearly links to need for cognition, which I mentioned before, relating to curiosity. And if you'll forgive the pun, an inquisitive mind. I always wanted to expand and learn about how things worked and what they did and where they were and where they came from. Learning more about how things, how, how the world works and where things come from. Here's another one about uh, something one of our um, quizzes did as a child. I went through the appendices of the Lord of the Rings and I just sort of tried to work out what they were saying about how to decipher the Elvish. Again, this is not something that all children do, but it shows this high need for cognition and inquisitiveness and curiosity. The next theme we've called I Set Out to Learn Them. And this reflected the variety of ways that quizzes prepared for quiz, in particular, whether they practiced deliberately or not. Some said they just did quizzes, informal practice, if you like. And this is what Cote and colleagues have called deliberate play to distinguish it from Ericsson's idea of deliberate practice. And Catherine and I have previously found that our, uh, our um, super expert cryptic crossword solvers tend to just do lots of crosswords in formal practice or deliberate play. Indeed, uh, uh, indeed some, uh, oh sorry, um, yes I've got a few quiz apps on my my phone, I play along with quiz shows, that's the the, the play and the doing. Indeed some hated this idea of deliberate practice, the idea of learning lists and stuff like, you know, like the professional quizzes. Well, that's just anathema to me. And another made the point that we talked about earlier on, um, that it's very hard to practice if you don't know what's going to be asked. There's no way you can prepare for general knowledge. Some quizzes did note that they actively kept up with current affairs. This is often a, a quiz topic. One saying, if I'm going in for once, I'm going in for a quiz, I'll take a look at, okay, a very good is the BBC magazine, seven days, seven questions. So this is uh, a, a small quiz about the things that have been in the news over the last week. And obviously it changes every week. So having to keep up to date there. Some quizzes, however, did admit to doing some deliberate practice. I set out to learn them, this is the 50 states of America, because it always annoyed me that I could only remember 49 of them. That's not perhaps quite the same reason for I just wanted to know all 50, so I learned them. There's a, there's a sort of uh, intrinsic challenge here. And 
when they were learning lists, they tended to acknowledge that it wasn't always enjoyable. I've taught myself to learn about these things, but I don't enjoy learning about those things as much as I love learning about, oh, I don't know, Roman history, perhaps. The third theme, the joy of quiz, relates to how immersed the quizzes were in both quizzing and the quiz community, as well as nodding to why they were so involved. The joy of quiz is in making a gratifying game out of all that knowledge sploshing around in our heads. I think that's one of my favourite quotes. You've got all the knowledge there, let's do something with it. Um, at Hoffman's master level, uh, quizzing can be quite a consuming passion. I've appeared on several TV programmes, in fact, 11 to date. That's a lot. And their involvement is more than merely taking part in the quizzes. And that's why I've said the quiz and its media and community. One said, I sometimes read reviews of the TV quiz shows. Like last season, there was an entertaining blog about University Challenge. Our interviewees mentioned their engagement in a variety of things, TV quizzes, quiz leagues and regular pub quizzing, as we can see from the following quotes. Yes, I found myself playing for the big money against the chaster each time and monitoring where I would be on the board. From my own living room, but imagining that I'm there, how would I do? Um, about a quiz league, the main one I do is the Grand Prix circuit, which takes place every month and is run by the British Quiz Association. And about pub quizzes, uh, one of our elite quizzes said that they committedly go to a pub quiz, have a regular team and want to do well. Might even have a sort of post-mortem. What went wrong? What can we do better? What do we need to brush up on? So there's a seriousness and an immersion going on there. The last theme, they're the elite really, supported the view that there are indeed a range of performance levels in quiz and that those at Hoffman's master level really do exist, as we can see from these quotes. There are only five or six quizzes who have won Mastermind and Brain in Britain, and they're the elite, really. Division one of the Quiz League of London, Kevin Ashman, whom I mentioned earlier on, who has won both Mastermind and Brain in Britain, Paul Sinar, uh, who is one of the chasers, David Stainer, Olaf Bortom, whom I mentioned before as well. These world champions who are really, really serious about it. And this was our elite quizzers recognizing others who were even higher uh, and more serious about that. Although it wasn't the case for every quiz. So people that go on mastermind, they're hardcore quizzes, much less the case with Only Connect. Perhaps the different types of quiz attract different uh, types of quizzes. Now, the fact that there are super quizzer, uh, super expert quizzes is important because it suggests that there may be ways of benchmarking how expert a certain quizzer is, as we can more easily do with ELO scores for chess players and race times for sprinters. Another interesting point that was made was that quizzing at high level was felt to require a certain level of confidence, particularly on account of the potential audience. One quiz was saying, I didn't think I was confident enough to go on TV at that stage. And secondly, if I made a fool of myself, you know, not that many people know of Brain of Britain. So I thought it would be a good, great way to ease myself in. Brain of Britain is on BBC Radio 4 and has a much smaller audience than say something like The Chase on television. Um, and also you can't be seen on radio. So it was a way of easing in until they felt confident enough that they could cope with perhaps making a fool of themselves. Another thing that was noted was that quizzing at top level tends to be fairly male dominated as with certain other uh, domains such as cryptic crossword uh, expertise. Um, only two of our seven quizzes were female, and um, this was felt to be an uncomfortable aspect of quizzing for some. One said probably in the top 100 in the world, you'd be lucky if there's, I don't know, three, four, five women in that. And quite tellingly, another quote, um, I've heard uh, from one of the female quizzes, I've heard various idiotic things about how they should make quizzes more, you know, feminine and appealing to women. 
And I think most of the women that I know, certainly including me, would stop doing quizzes, quizzing straight away if it got like that. So trying to dumb it down or feminize it is not the answer. So what have we learned from these four themes? Well, firstly, elite quizzers enjoy learning, want to know more, and this suggests a high need for cognition. Secondly, there's no single answer to our original question of how elite quizzes do know so much. Some just absorb information like a sponge and do lots of quizzes, quizzes uh, whereas others perhaps put in the deliberate practice. We saw that serious quizzes are heavily immersed in the quiz media and quizzing can be an all-consuming passion. And finally, quizzing does appear to be a domain in which elite super experts exist though it isn't necessarily as inclusive as some fields. Now, building on this last theme, the, the elite really, we were able to suggest a fairly clear mapping to Hoffman's levels of proficiency. And this may allow us to benchmark quiz expertise in future studies of quizzing. So for instance, someone who is a Premier League quizzer, a top flight show winner on television and who sets quiz profession professionally would probably be at Hoffman's master level. A league quizzer and TV competitor who perhaps doesn't win as many, they would be uh, at Hoffman's expert level. And perhaps a regular pub quizzer who doesn't go beyond might be at journeyman level. So these are possible ways of uh, um, of seeing how we could map to the levels of proficiency. We also became aware through the interviews uh, of the many types of individual differences between quizzes, not just their ability, but things like uh, their preferences for whether to play solo or be in a team, for general knowledge or specialist subjects, uh, whether they preferred sport or science or entertainment and also their practice regimes, the different way that they actually prepared for the quiz. There are also many different types of quizzes and they differ in their formats. Uh, it might be um, a team game like University Challenge or um, solo like uh, Mastermind, for instance. It might be uh, a timed quiz or not. Um, so there are, the, the challenges are different as well, a whole variety of challenges. Um, advanced knowledge, making connections or answering easy questions, but being the first on the buzzer. And also the importance of the consequences of winning. For instance, compare a TV show, TV quiz with a large audience and a large monetary prize, and compare that with a game of Trivial Pursuit with your family. What are the consequences in each of winning or not? And finally, as we've seen, there are a large number of factors that influence how and why people engage with and then stick with quiz. So having obtained this information, we were now in a much better position to create a comprehensive GICA stage one survey as we knew better what questions we should be asking. So these included things like, when did you first start quizzing? How old were you? Um, what are your reading habits? What hobbies do you have? What type of quiz do you enjoy most? What are your subject preferences? Which subjects do you enjoy most? Um, how do you tend to learn new things? Do you absorb information like a sponge or do you deliberately learn lists of, fact, uh, uh, of facts? And what are your motivations for quizzing? Why do you quiz? Lovely idea. We've done this. We've actually done this. We've constructed our survey and asked a broad range of quizzes from relative novices right up to the super elite to complete it. And we actually obtained over 700 responses. However, we haven't analyzed them yet. So that might be the topic of my next talk. Once we've analyzed the survey, we can then address more research questions such as those I discussed earlier. For instance, what factors allow a quizzer to go beyond being a competent journeyman and make it all the way up to the elite master level. We can compare the two and see the differences. Why do different quizzes prefer different types of quiz, such as perhaps mastermind, and it's often rather erudite specialist knowledge on one hand, 
And on the other hand, making connections quizzes like Only Connect and Brain of Britain. And also, is there any way that we can increase our retention of facts that we come across? Can we become more sponge-like and, and uh, absorb information more easily? So, back to those questions I asked you at the start. If, like many people, you would like to know the answers, here they are. Who won the Oscar for Best Actress in 2000? It was Julia Roberts in Erin Brockovich. On the border of which two countries would you find Victoria Falls? Well, they both begin with Z, that's Zambia and Zimbabwe. And what links Tuscany, one of a quartet of superhero shelled reptiles, and the ceiling of a certain chapel in the Vatican? Well, that was Michelangelo, one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Did you get them right? Here are a few uh, relevant references. You'll be able to see uh, back at this at some point. And image credits. Um, if you'd like to know more about the sort of research that we're doing in the Create Hub, uh, Catherine, Jill, myself, uh, do have a look at our blog. Um, there is QR code and also the um, uh, web page, web, web page address. And if you've got some time, why not take part in a research survey that we've actually got running at the moment? And again, the QR code will take you to the information page. Very many thanks for listening. And now it's your turn to ask me questions, though perhaps not quiz questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Philip. That's very, very entertaining and informative talk um, indeed. Uh, Jill and I will start to browse through the uh, through the chat. Do keep those questions um, coming, but um, I'll kick us off with one that we've received earlier. Um, what did you mean by erudite special specialist knowledge that you were talking about uh, when you were referring to mastermind a few a few slides ago? Yeah, mastermind. It's quite. Um... It's quite specialised, it's quite niche, and again, this is something that we weren't particularly looking for in the interviews, but one of the things that um, Emma noticed in some of these uh, um, answers was differences between what they call, what the quiz is called highbrow and lowbrow information. So highbrow information might be the works of, of Chaucer or, or Shakespeare or something with literature or classical music or art, Whereas low, lowbrow was perhaps sports knowledge, football teams, pop music, and it's no, it's it's not particularly easier to learn uh, or, or to know uh, lowbrow information than highbrow. Perhaps it's a sort of snobbery there. I'm not sure, but it's noticeable when people go on mastermind and their chosen specialised subject is the works of Britney Spears, for instance. So there's a sort of um, I think when I say erudite, I'm talking about the fact that it's quite niche and it's not something that many uh, of the audience watching Mastermind will probably know the answers to. Cool. Um, I've got a question here is what aspects of your findings might challenge the traditional um, kind of idea of expertise development? I think you mentioned Ericsson particularly here, but yeah, what, what aspects do these mm. findings? kind of challenge about that absolutely um erickson is someone who in the 1990s put forward this idea of deliberate practice and during the 2000s and into the 2010s he made it very clear his view was that um deliberate practice was necessary and actually it was sufficient it was all you needed anyone could become an expert something or other through 10,000 hours of practice, which uh, Malcolm Gladwell turned into uh, 10 years, or was it the other way around, 10 years turned into 10,000 hours. Um, but there are various domains where this seems to be less of the case. Um, Catherine and I were looking at uh, cryptic crossword solvers. Similarly here, we had quite a lot of these elite um, quizzes saying, no, I don't do any deliberate practice. So, um, this links actually to uh, some research which was published in about 10 years ago now uh, by someone called Zach Hambrick, suggesting that for many domains, yes, deliberate practice is necessary, but it's not sufficient. 
There's all sorts of other things like motivation and background and opportunity that make it more likely that you'll become an expert chess player or professional musician or whatever. Um, so that's one way that it might challenge this traditional, these traditional aspects. Another is the starting age. Um, professional musicians, chess grandmasters, as I said, they'll often be starting age six, seven, eight. Um, if they're musicians, they may even start with Suzuki for strings and piano at age three or four. But certainly for cryptic crosswords and potentially for quiz, people don't really get into it seriously until late teenage years or even uh, certainly teenagers uh, or even later for some. Um, so I suppose what, what we're doing here is we're taking different uh, expertise domains and trying to challenge some of the generally accepted knowledge about quizzes and um, realize that's not always the case for each uh, each domain. I hope that's a reasonable answer to that question. Thank you, Jill. Uh, I've got another question here. Thank you very much. Um, some of the skills or habits you mentioned during the presentation seem to echo generically some of the strengths or approaches of the neurodivergent population. Do you think there's a greater proportion of neurodivergent persons within the quiz population than the general? That's an excellent question. Uh, I would not be surprised if that was the case. Um, I think there are some aspects of neurodivergent populations, such as um, uh, more focus, le uh, less, um, I'm trying to remember what the, the term is, but um, less broad and more, more concentration on detail. Uh, and that might, uh, and also um, sort of some obsessive collection uh, collecting and, and that sort of um, uh, hobby. Yes, they could be linked. So I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me if there is some sort of a link between um, or, or sort of overlap between neuro, uh, um, neuro atypicality or neurodivergence and quizzes. And it would be very interesting to look at, in general, the types of hobbies uh, that are more or less um, common uh, in different neurodivergent populations. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we actually asked on the survey, didn't we, um, sort of whether people had done things like stamp collecting or mm. um, not not train spotting exactly, but we, we did ask about hobbies and particularly collecting hobbies in childhood because mm. um, there's sort of um, reading through the encyclopedias and not being able to stop and uh, the the sort of immersion that was that was quite significant, wasn't it? Um, from, from Absolutely. The interviews. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I gave those quotes about learning Elvish. Uh, and and all the kings and queens of England. So yes, um, that's a very nice point about neurodivergence. Thank you. So we have a, a, a psychologist in the audience um, yeah. who <laughs> has asked rather playfully the question. Let's let's hope it's been playful. People with low scores for agreeableness and the big five personality framework tend to be more competitive. So are competitive quizzers rather disagreeable people? People with low <laughs> scores tend to be more competitive. On on which of the so on agreeableness? So people on low agreeableness. on agreeableness are more competitive. So does that mean that competitive quizzes are therefore disagreeable people? There might be a correlation. <laughs> um, yes, I, I suspect, uh, and actually, this is not just the case for quizzes, but I've certainly anecdotally come across examples of people you know, very successful um, business people, very successful celebrities who are not really the easiest people to get on with. And I think there's quite a lot of research looking at things like the dark triad, particularly things like Machiavellianism and narcissism in sort of the most um, successful, really big uh, business people. I'm talking about people like Trump and Branson and so on, how, how there might be links there. Um, I suppose 
if you're going to be very competitive, you're going to have to um, beat other people and not worry about them. So there could be a a bit of a um, a using other people to an extent. I don't know, but it would be quite interesting, I suppose, to get um, a whole range of quizzes to perhaps complete the big five and see if there is a link with agreeableness and uh, and competitiveness. And I guess I guess what struck me actually is if you think about some of the kind of the the lower levels of quizzes, often people, for example, who do pub quizzes, that's mm. very much a group activity, isn't it? You don't tend to do a pub quiz on your own. You tend to sit in a group, mm. um, which is, I, I guess, perhaps different to say crossworders. I, I assume you tend to, most people tend to do crosswords on their own, whatever level they are. They wouldn't sit in a group in a pub well, <laughs> yeah, some people, people do collaboratively mm -hmm. of, yeah but um yeah people don't tend to do crosswords regularly together but but mm -hmm. sometimes maybe in twos or threes but it, it makes me uh it reminds me of cases in pub quizzes or that sort of thing where two members of the same team know the answer they both know that they've got different answers but they both know they're right and then of course you have got this uh, which one's going to win through and does this relate to agreeableness and competitiveness and so on mm. there, uh, was a, so, yeah. there was a quote by one of the participants which I don't think you featured on the talk where they were saying um, they were very competitive and they were saying it's not just winning it's completely what did they say annihilating or uh, it's crushing the opponent and it was there was a real joy in talking about crushing the opponents um yes. which was quite <laughs> which was quite uh quite quite surprising at the time enjoyable but quite quite surprising yes, that, that's that's true so again that's mm. perhaps the this competitiveness that, that mm. we were talking about um I've got another question here. Well, no, I've, I've, I've actually found that um, it's a competitive, it's this competitive drive. If you're in a competition, then you want to stamp all over the opposition, quite honestly, you know, okay, and it's not just winning, it's utterly massacring the opposition. That's so right. testosterone by any <laughs> other name. So this, rather than bring it in as sort of uh, a competition of agreeableness, testosterone, it's talking about sort of gender and, uh, and, and hormones. Yeah. Um, so another, another question then. Um, did the COVID-19 lockdown affect people's quiz habits? And if so, how? I suspect it probably did. One of the things, um, I mean, I wonder what the what the lockdown would have been like 20 years earlier when the Internet was very much in its uh, infancy. By the time we were all collect, uh, connected, um, it was one of the few group pastimes that were possible during lockdown. And in fact, quiz popularity did grow. There's, there is evidence that it grew considerably during the pandemic. Um, and there are um, new, you know, new apps and websites. Um, there was one called Kahoot, I think, um, where a whole group, one person would set the quiz and the whole group would do it either in one room, if they were in a family, or uh, across you know the internet and zoom and so on uh quiz up psych um sporkle i mentioned earlier and jay flynn who does the um uh quiz uh weekly quiz on radio two in the mornings he actually came to um uh, the public attention through his virtual pub quiz which started and was regular during the pandemic so yes i suspect it was um, it was something that either people who hadn't really quizzed much before tried during the pandemic, or people who had and enjoyed quizzing tried to stick with it as much as they could uh, as a way of uh, well, I mentioned social reasons before as a way of linking with other people. So yeah, I think it did affect quiz habits. I think they increased. Look, I will. I mean, I can see we've got about. A few, just a couple of minutes left, so I'll, I'll pick up one other question that I have here. So it's, um, around um, quizzing, to what extent do you think there are quizzes around the world? Um, we've obviously focused on an English-speaking um, population, and, and but but what how what what's your sense of kind of more broadly across the world in terms of quiz? Oh, uh, I mean quizzes quizzes do. Um, I mean, broadcast quizzes 
uh, were all the way across the world, I'm quite sure. Um, I was looking before, uh, let me just check. Um, yes, I mean, I talked about who wants to be a millionaire. Uh, this is a, an international show and it's in um, many, many different countries now. A lot of these have um, spread. I think quite a few quizzes actually didn't start in the UK and they came over here. Um, so there'll be a lot of uh, international versions of these. I think quiz has probably historically been around for a long time. Uh, we've had sort of riddles from, uh, you know, um, early two, three thousand years ago, these sorts of uh, puzzles and riddles. Um, I think I know more about British quiz because that's my experience but yeah i do think that quiz exists probably to the same extent throughout the world um it, and it probably doesn't really require literacy either um it depends what 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 the topic of the quizzes might change from culture to culture but i think it's probably there and present always brilliant Okay, well, I think we will. I think we will we'll probably wrap things up there. Um, with with thanks um, to to Philip once again for for really informative, really enjoyable talk. Thank you, thank you so much. So um, I'm afraid that's that's the uh, the the wrap up of the uh, the, the three um, lectures in this in this series. Uh, thank you to those of you who have come to to all of them. I see some familiar names in the audience, and uh, um, we uh, the recordings will be um, available of, of all the lectures. If you did miss them, they will be available on on YouTube um, in the end on the University of Buckingham's YouTube um, account. My talk from um, fortnight ago is already up there, and the other two will be joining um, soon. So thank you very much for coming and uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves and uh, we're now going to um, terminate the, uh, the, the, the session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.